So the key ideas of reinforcement learning were developed early on in the ideas of computing itself. And while there are many people who advocated creating a learner or a device that could learn for itself, we've chosen to share this one quotation from you from Alan Turing. Instead of trying to produce the program to simulate the adult mind, why don't we rather try to produce one that simulates the child, right? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. So the whole idea was to create a general learning algorithm that could be exposed to the proper environments and problems, learn from the decisions it makes, and arrive at the experience that wouldn't need to be programmed or instructed directly by supervision signals. So let's recap what we learned from week one when we examined the paradigms of machine learning. What are some of the characteristics of reinforcement learning? The key difference is there's no supervisor, right? We have a data matrix of X's instances, and we don't have a supervision signal or Y. We do have a reward signal, right? This thing here tells us whether we're doing the right thing or not, but not directly in terms of a classification output, like this was the right action to take or this was the wrong action to take. Just some type of preference about whether one state versus another might be more preferred. And a key part of that is that this feedback is delayed. It doesn't happen instantaneously, right? For example, even in the real world where you decide whether to study for this module or another module, or decide to sleep, or decide to consume a social media, it's not really clear whether a particular action has a good outcome or not. And deciding what to do um, is one of the important parts about propagating this reward signal back through uh, all of the time steps to when we don't have an immediate idea of what to do and uh, helping to inform those decisions. Of course, this type of uh, setup means that time matters because we actually have sequential observations and at each part of the sequence we need to make an action, and those actions will affect the subsequent uh, state of the environment and the agent and affect the data that it receives. So definitely not ID data. So there are lots of examples of this, and here we've just illustrated one of them. This is from uh, one of the current uh, trends in AI to uh, play massively a multiplayer online role-playing games like Dota. Uh, so this is the OpenAI 5 uh, set of agents that are working in parallel um, as five different computer players to try to defeat um, themselves when they're training uh, through reinforcement learning and ultimately apply that test time to uh, try to beat human uh, players. So um, there are a couple other examples here, for example, getting uh, autonomous uh, uh, agents, whether they're vehicles or robots, to do particular types of uh, patterns in executing their navigation or their stunts. Or, for example, in the case of robotic uh, trading systems, which uh, the rewards are quite uh, obvious, right? We are talking about the uh, number of dollars returned in the portfolio. Or even things like controlling a power station, where electric generation might be one of the reward factors. So I'd like you to take a look at these uh, over the next couple of minutes while we go through the next couple of slides to try to figure out for each of these five examples how the terminology applies to this state. And I'll just mention here a lot of the slides that we're using uh, today are coming from David Silver's lecture at UCL. Um, his lecture is a less abbreviated than the one here. So if you have any doubts, you can go through the free lectures that he has on YouTube uh, provided by DeepMind to get a more in-depth uh, solution to some of the exercises that we're going to ask. So first and foremost in reinforcement learning is the idea of a reward. Right? A reward 
is some type of scalar feedback signal. It's as simple as that. You know, we're going to boil everything down, whether it's a vector representation or something that would change over time, or having multiple different dimensions about what you care about into a single scalar signal. So you just can think of some type of dimensionality reduction uh, that is going to reduce it to a single uh, value. And this value is going to be specific to a particular time step, right? And basically that just tells us how well we're doing at any time step t. And um, it's very clear then what we need to do is just construct an agent that's going to maximize the cumulative reward over all the time steps. So like I sort of hinted to, we're saying that all types of goals, whether they um, are uh, rewards in terms of score or in terms of dollar or in terms of, you know, uh, finding a particular loved one or uh, reading books or anything like that or scoring well on this uh, module, all of these goals can be boiled down to some type of maximization of cumulative rewards, right? So especially here, what we're thinking about is um, for all of the scenarios that we wrote on the previous slide, can you think about what the reward signal are? So the ones here that I've illustrated, right? So what would be the reward for guiding a helicopter or defeating uh, humans in a massively multiplayer online game? Managing a portfolio, um, we said that's probably the, the most obvious one. Making robots walk or do stunts or controlling a power station. So as we also alluded to, RL is a sequential decision-making process, right? So if our goal is to maximize the expected total future rewards, we want to be able to select actions to do so. So it's a decision process, right? So importantly, we can't really decouple what actions we're making now from those in the future because those actions affect the state of the system and may have long-term consequences. And rewards for doing certain things may be significantly delayed. For example, if you study for the final earlier and you um, space out your repetition and understand that uh, gradual reinforcement of concepts helps you uh, keep those things in uh, the back of your mind during a final, um, those things may eventually pay off, but their immediate reward might be negative, right? You spend time when you could have be having fun, for example, playing Dota. Right? So it um, comes out in this statement here. It may be better to sacrifice immediate rewards to gain more long term rewards. Right? So, uh, definitely all of these types of things that you can see down here. So, we've illustrated a couple of them um, for some of the scenarios, but you can think about some others. Right? So, for example, I've always told my students that it's very important to participate in class, and this goes for even. Um, research students doing their FYP or Europe, because this helps to improve your own understanding just by asking, or as they say, um, to learn a concept best is uh, most important to try to teach it. Okay, another example is, you know, blocking an opponent's move. Um, you know, you could make defensive maneuvers that um, help to shore up your defenses where um, you don't necessarily get a score for um, destroying an opponent or capturing some of its pieces, right? Because this might help your chances of winning uh, because you can defend an attack against an aggressor uh, from many moves from the current time step. So let's try to think of it in a more concrete term. Let's say we have, um, you know, partitioned our problem into a series of time slices, right? And for each time slice, we're going to say that the agent is in a particular state. And this state allows the agent to make maybe several different types of decisions uh, in terms of what action it takes. It's going to choose one and execute that particular action, right? Um, as a result of having received uh, information about what state it is in, uh, through some observation and knowing 
that being in that state entitles it to uh, observing perhaps some reward value. Okay, this is uh, again optional. We didn't. We said before that we're not always um, necessarily going to observe a reward for every time step. Okay, and as a result of that, what will happen next is that the environment will receive that action. Um, at that first time step and uh, incremental time steps because that action has a consequence. It may change the state that we're in. So the state of the world could change. Uh, so we have a new observation and that particular uh, state or of the environment might uh, change the amount of reward that we would get at the next time step. Right, so this cycle continues on and onwards until we get to the end of the learning episode or the trajectory. So uh, we could have multiple cases of, of these trajectories that are happening for an agent, right? So for example, what would uh, this cycle look like for any one of the environments that we were talking about um, in the last two slides? Check your understanding for that and Come back to the next section.